Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Word Podcast. It is、uh, now turned into a podcast. The keeping it short and brief with just some shorter bursts of information is unfortunately not happening. There's too much information out there that I want to communicate. And too many great questions I've received from so many of you regarding the podcast, and that you are truly enjoying it, and that you're getting a lot of value out of it. So, until I run out of material, I am going to keep talking about things that you might be wondering about, you might have questions about in the ultra endurance world,、um, things that you might wonder about as one of my coached athletes, or also things that you might wonder about. Although you're not coached, but know that I can help you answer or help address given the ultra endurance world that I sort of work in. So, so from there, the first thing I wanted to talk about because it's that time of year, and I've gotten a few requests, inquiries, also questions from my athletes regarding. What to do when we get sick at this time of year? And I didn't want to delay long、um, into this podcast before talking about it because, it because it is quite important. So, when we're training for an ultra endurance event, what we need to keep in mind is that it, the training is or puts an incredible toll on our body.、Um, while we're fit and healthy, Um, it can barely hang on in doing this and absorbing it and doing it effectively, and then being able to wake up the next day and either do it again or just feel good and healthy and connected to your body. But when we start getting sick, things get knocked out of balance, and our immune system and our body is working hard to get healthy. It is providing extra energy and resources. To getting you healthy again, whether it is dealing with the medicine that you're putting in your body, and oftentimes that's a foreign chemical compound,、um, or even if you do it via natural path and homeopathically,、um, it is still working hard on helping you regenerate and rebuild and get ready for a healthy body again. So. If we throw training on top of this weakened body, this weakened immune system that's busy fighting sickness, that's busy recuperating from sickness, it is just delaying the process of getting healthy. And so, my rule of thumb for all of my athletes, as well as for myself, and this is one of the few things I've been actually really good about with my own body and my own training over the many years of doing this. Is that when we're sick, I say get healthy first. Put all the resources and time that you usually spend in training for training and put them to resting, sleeping, recovering, replenishing, refueling.、Um, your body needs energy in order to fight the sickness or to get healthy. That requires eating. Your body needs a lot of fluids in it because it is getting dehydrated, fighting the sickness or a fever, etc. So there's that. First of all, focus all your attention on getting healthy.、Um, and that requires extra focus. You might have to just lay around and take a nap or shut the body down a bit more and do very little exercise.、Um, in this case, zero. So, we're not used to doing that. And so, it takes a little bit and it takes focus to focus on your health, the same focus it takes to focus on training. Then, once healthy, I also tell all my athletes 24 more hours of rest. So, when you're feeling 100% ready and healthy and back to normal, And you're itching to work out, you're itching to jump back onto the training plan. I always say give it one more day. And the reasoning behind this is twofold. One, our perception of being healthy and us truly being healthy is a big difference.、Um, oftentimes, once we engage in some exercise, we find that there's still some recurring weakness, recurring cough, recurring fever, etc., in our body.、Um, secondly, is 
that extra 24 hours allows us and our immune system and our regenerated body to just settle in a little bit more. The worst thing we could do when after being sick is falling back into sickness and have a recurring sickness or have something creep up again in two, three days so that we are once again delayed from our training, our progression, and our movement towards our goals via the training plan. So to, re- re- to summarize, excuse me, when sick, stop training, recover, get focused on becoming 100% healthy again. Then, once healthy, give it another 24 hours of rest to gradually resume the training plan. In most cases, I would say most of you uh, communicate with me that you are sick and therefore are taking some time off or a day or two off or what should I do, I'm sick. I would say 99% to 100% of the time, I'm already going into your training plan then and adjusting your workouts, returning back to easy cycling, easy running, whatever it is your sport is. Now, the only thing I hesitate on when we have been sick is swimming. Um, Swimming not only plunges our body into cooler temperatures because we don't swim in 96-degree temperature water. We swim in 70-degree water, in 70s, I should say. And that plunge and that submerging ourselves into cooler water, again, puts an extra tax on the energy system. It needs to work harder to stay warm and so forth. So I like to wait with swimming for an extra two, three, four, five days post being sick. The other aspect of being sick is when you're coughing up a lung or blowing snots out of your nose, excuse the language, it, while I'm swimming in that pool or others, and it's just not very nice or fair or respectful to the other swimmers in the lane or in the pool as you're blowing out the chunks that you have that are residual in your body from being sick. So just out of respect and waiting an extra few days until you're truly healthy versus blowing your nose in the gutter. So I hope that helps. Just focus on becoming healthy, and we can always catch up on the training plan or adjust the training plan so that you will be back to fitness and wondering, man, how did I ever wonder that I missed a workout or that I would feel you know, like I'm not keeping up with my plan? We can always adjust to a point where we'll get you extremely fit again and quite quickly, but that won't happen unless you're healthy. So focus on getting healthy. Another question I've received lately, or an inquiry, and less a question, but just curiosity, is for many of you that are doing strength or core work at this time of year, TRX, Pilates, um, a true strength routine for building muscle mass, um, all kinds of different routines are out there currently that many of you are doing, and I'm a big supporter of is I have all of you either swim, bike, or run post your strength work. And many wonder or also question why it has to be done right after, why not later in the day. And, you know, I understand that many of you have a busy life schedule and have to get to work or have to get back to your family, etc. But ideally, we do these 30, 45-minute stretches immediately post-strength core, body weight balance work. And the reason for this is we are now fatigued. The muscle is fatigued and the chain that we are recruiting in order to do the activity, the said activity, whether that's swim, bike, or run, is fatigued. It's compromised. So then returning to your primary sport and its movements on that fatigued muscle, on that fatigued um, platform that we are at at, the po- at that moment is extremely helpful and beneficial. One, you're recruiting the proper muscle groups again and trying to fire the chain while tired. That's always good. Two, you also become more hyper aware of your motions and the muscles you're recruiting doing those exercises. So on tired legs, no- noticing 
the support muscles that are being recruited and being used because the main muscles are so fatigued that now the support muscles have a sense, extra sense of awareness as they're being fired. You will notice more about your pedal stroke, where the power is, how you're sweeping, how you're pulling up, how you're engaging your hip flexor, how you're coming over the top of the pedal stroke, etc. In your running motion, again, you're noticing what your form does when it's fatigued. Are your hips falling out of place, out of alignment? How is your foot landing? How is your heel engaging? How is your, not push off, since I don't really like to call it a push off, but how is the lift of your heel and your ankle coming off the ground when it's fatigued? What is your body posture and so on while running? Fatigued. And again, the fatigue of this isn't from a training volume application purpose um, or sense. It's more because you use such powerful muscles in order to do the strength work and f create the fatigue. And then, of course, swimming on a fatigued body is um, also extremely helpful because you slow down and you mo notice the movements through the chain of the pull and how you're lifting your arms. And everything becomes more aware, um, hyper-aware because you know, you're tired and you're noticing how many muscles and how many things are being recruited into in order to do the motion. Um, those of you that are doing it like this all have noticed and validated why you're doing it. And it feels really powerful when you're doing the exercise post-strength and how important it is to connect the chain of movement and connect the chain of how it's firing back to your sport or group of activities that you usually do. So I hope that answers it a little bit um, because, again, strength is great, um, but I also want to clean it up and stay connected with the motions that we're doing for our respective sports. The other thing to keep in mind on a side note with the strength is you know, when we're doing the strength work, we're not really looking for um, repetitive, high-volume action. Um, that means I'm not looking for 20, 30 repeats of anything. Um, we already do that in our cycling, running, or swimming motion. Um, we can increase the resistance on all of those activities and therefore do the same effect as what you're doing if you're doing more than 15, 20 reps. The purpose of strength and truly to build those stronger joints and that cartilage and that chain of muscle firing through the respective activity is to um, do it at a resistance that is higher than what we can mimic, whether big gear work or hill repeats, etc., running and cycling. And so doing the six, seven, eight, nine, ten repeats and failure and really having to focus on the last two or three or four um, repeats, that is the key. Again, strength, we want to be doing things that we're not typically doing in our day-to-day -day activity. And um, high volume repetitions are already what we're doing in our activity. So keep that in mind. If you have more questions regarding strength, just feel free to email me, of course, and I'll break that down a little bit more specifically. I have two more quick hit topics that I received emails and inquiries and questions on, and then I'm going to go into sort of a longer topic and discussion. The next one that came up and I'm a strong believer in is, you know, somebody was asking me, um, why ultra endurance coaching is so different than regular coaching. And it was more in the context of having experience in these sports. And so that goes back to that age old wisdom of, you know, anybody could be a coach. They don't have to be at the top of the sport to have to be a good coach. They have to be a good communicator. They have to be able to listen. They have to have good knowledge in the sport and also have a way to connect with the athlete in order for them to have the adaptations and results that they're looking for. But, you know, 
in endurance, in ultra endurance coaching, there's a different factor that comes into play, and that is the mindset and what happens in in these ten, twelve, thirty hour events. I know I jumped from twelve to thirty hours there, but um, and there I feel again. This is my opinion. This is not something um, that I that is the rule, but in my opinion, experience in ultra endurance events the suffering, the emotional peaks and valleys that you go through, the dark spots that you hit, um, the things that you must overcome in order to get to the finish line, the doubts that you have um, and how strong those seeds of doubt become um, are all critical in understanding the athlete and what the event is that you're doing. And in, in no disrespect to other coaches or other coaching methods, in ultra-endurance sports, unless you've done 100 miles on the trails and you felt what it's like to be out there for 24, 25, 30 hours and suffered and that pain and that numbness in your legs and that just repetitive motion and that overcoming of doubt and emotional valleys, as well as um, highs and joy and those sensations. But in order to get to that finish line, in order to relate with athletes that have gone, that are looking to go through this, I feel that experience and having done it is a lot more important in the ultra endurance world because those factors come into play and become magnified so much more as you're going about these ultra-endurance endeavors. Um, You know, having the experience and helping the athlete prepare for those valleys, those dark miles, those emotional miles, those difficult miles, um, that's truly what coaching is all about. Um, mainly, uh, many people, excuse me, could could help you get ready for the distance, um, especially in ultra endurance training. You don't really do the distance; it's not feasible. It's not realistic. You it take you weeks to recover, so you're doing a third, maybe, or a half distance in training. So you don't hit those emotional valleys and those dark spots. But come race day, as a coach, I want my athlete prepared. For what happens, you know, 23, 24 hours into their event, 10 to 11 to 12 hours into their event, um, and what happens and how to approach things when things go wrong, because guess what? They will go wrong. There is no perfect day where everything just goes perfectly smoothly and you have a perma smile on your face. It just doesn't exist. And so the better equipped you are as the athlete to deal and expect disaster on race day, and not necessarily a complete failure and disaster, but, you know, expect bad things to happen, expect things to go wrong, expect emotions and negative thoughts to steer you wrong. The better I can prepare you for that, for you to overcome them, um, the better you will get through them and achieve your goal and achieve that result. Um, that happens to the the world elite. Um, as many of you know, I was in Kona this year working with three professional athletes with regards to mindset and overcoming past demons on the course. And um, these athletes have had plenty of good results everywhere else in the world, but not in Kona. And so we worked quite hard and quite focused and deliberately towards improving the mindset for the day. Because again, when you're going up against the world's best in the harshest and the most bizarre of environments, you have to expect that where you usually are positioned off the bike, where you usually are positioned after the swim, you will not be positioned in Hawaii. Too many things go wrong. Too many other factors come into play. Competition is raised at a level that is truly nerve-wracking. And so knowing and preparing and having 
practiced that, um, it will allow you to reconnect with your subconscious mind to say, I've been here. I know what's happening. I can recognize the signals. This is my standard operating procedure for this. It's got to be that simple, that black and white standard operating procedure. I mean, just a simple list of things in your mind that you know, when I get a flat, this is what I'll do. This is how I'll approach it. I've done it 10 times. It worked out great last time. The last nine times, it takes me two and a half minutes to be done with it. Therefore, I can factor two and a half minutes. I can handle two and a half minutes out of my 10 hour day. Boom, done. There's your operating procedure. There's your list. That goes into your subconscious mind so that you don't panic on race day. So it doesn't take you more than two and a half minutes because you're fumbling and messing with stuff because you're nervous and you're panicking. No. We'll get through that. We have practiced that. I feel awful. I feel miserable. I feel like I'm going to puke. It'd be so easy to stop right here. No. We've talked about this. We've worked through this. We've been here. And I, as your coach, have helped you work through this moment. Man, Chris was telling me this was going to happen. And look, here I am feeling like this. We've worked through that. He said, do this, do that. Try this step. Reconnect. Reengage your brain. You know, look or tap a spot on your body, you know, with a connection. Tap your heart. Understand the why, why you're out here. Reconnect with your drive and your motivation and the positive things you did in training and move on. Or look at your clock. You know, typically it takes me three to five minutes after having a gel or after having something to eat to feel better again because my emotional lows were caused by nutrition, not because of performance. And so look at your clock. Give it three or five minutes and notice, wow, in five minutes he was right. My mood did change. Now you know that from training, so you're not going to be saying in a race, oh, he's right. You know it's right because you've practiced it and you've seen it. And so when those moments happen in a race, whether it's in a 100-miler, whether it's in a 200-miler, whether it's in a 10-mile swim, whether it's in an Ironman, whether it's in a 50-miler, it doesn't matter. It is preparing mentally for the peaks and valleys and mainly the valleys because the peaks are easier to get through. It's because of experience. And your coach, in this case for many of you, me, you would hope that he has or she has gone through those valleys and has been there and looked around and rummaged around and try to figure out a method, an approach, a connection while being in those valleys that I can then or that person can then help teach others, coach others how to navigate through those valleys. So a long explanation why I feel that coaching experience in the ultra endurance world is so critical. And whether in an Ironman, whether in a half Ironman or all the ultra running distances, or also especially in the swimming world. Um, on a side note to that, uh, the swimming world... When you're getting into ultra endurance, swimming and training, but mainly competing and training, talk about a mental game. Yes, physically you get exhausted, but if you're not familiar with staring at blackness and darkness and swimming through the night or swimming for hours and hours on end looking at the same black surroundings because it's a deep lake or it's the ocean and there's nothing happening there's no floor you're not always swimming over the the beach or where you can see the bottom that's where your mind needs to be strong because you're looking into the same black hole for hours and hours upon end and sure every breath you look around but guess what that looks the same too so On a side note, swimmers, when you guys are doing that ultra-endurance swimming stuff, and yes, I've been there, I've done them, but (laughs) it was not my forte or expertise, nor is it a place I wanted to spend too much time in. You know, 40 years of staring at a black line at the bottom of a pool is plenty for me, um, of which I would say, you know, 25 of them were multiple times a day, every day, so... Um, anyway, 
So back to answering that, that inquiry, ultra endurance coaching is different due to experience. Lastly, on the quick hit stuff is I wanted to uh, give a shout out to one of my athletes who um, almost negative split his marathon this past weekend. He did California International Marathon in Sacramento. And we had set out, I would say, late October um, to change his training a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot. Um, We know we need to work on his running and we know... Next year, he's going to bring about a bunch of 70.3s, uh, no Ironman, and we have a specific and deliberate goal to have the best possible running season next season um, with regards to it being in a 70.3 triathlon. And so since then, November and now December, but most of October and November, we've been doing a fair amount of running, um, nothing spectacular. No type of speed work, nothing too crazy, just steady, weekly running. Hour and a half on a Tuesday, hour and a half on a Sunday, um, a treadmill workout on a Friday, um, a few other runs during the week so that he had a steady volume and a steady turnover of just steady run work. Sure, the treadmill did add a little bit of speed to it, but otherwise, walk out the door, run 90 minutes, run two hours, be done. Um, You know, at times off the bike, other times later in the day, other times the only workout of the day. But running is the focus. Efficiency of motion, economy of motion, um, creating a more efficient running stride. We're working on switching that over a little bit. There's a, a fair amount of heel striking happening. And... Yeah, he just straight out of training, ran his personal best on Saturday, um, no, excuse me, Sunday, and he almost negative split it, and no taper, no nothing, just wake up and go do it. Um, And that highlights a training methodology that I am very fond of, and that many of you have heard me talk about in the past, and, and still talk about, and that is your ability to get so efficient in the aerobic capacity of your sport that you can roll out of bed and do a solid time. Now, in this case, he's been looking to improve upon his past marathon time for a lot for a while. And despite us training for a marathon last year, the result wasn't quite as positive, mainly because either it was that disconnect that you've heard me talk about here before on race day performance versus training performance, and that there, that delta is something now we know we need to work on since straight out of training, he went faster than a rested marathon. But also, it's that growth in um, efficiency of motion. It's that growth in knowing that you've done the pace um, enough. Um, and it's his ability to become more aware of his running and what he's doing and how he is going about his form and that he can run the speed, whether off the bike, whether it's 6 a.m. in the morning, 6 p.m., or on a treadmill, up, down, backwards, all around. And so um, good progress so far for the season. Um, He took it out. I don't remember exactly the time he took it out in, but he missed a a negative split. So he positive split only by 30 some odd seconds. So um, again, that's the type of training I'm looking for. And uh, nice work, Freddie, Um, as many of you know him. And uh, he deserves some kudos. He's been working hard for this um, improved running, and he's really engaged, and he's really focused on staying lean and fit and ready to run throughout the winter and hopefully we will have all those results that we're looking for and working hard towards in 2017 with regards to a 70.3 run it's pretty funny now that the quick hits are out of the way i've probably recorded this section oh three times already um, just because i didn't like how it sounded or i started rambling into a more Uh, boring, sleepy, monotone description of the things I wanted to go about. So let me try this again, and hopefully 
we can keep a little bit more energy in it because listening to this last piece, it was pretty awful. So um, the next topic I wanted to talk about, and I did call it a few times story time with Chris before I deleted it. Um, I'm not sure I really want to describe it like that. That sounds a little boring as well as prepping you all for here he goes. He's going to go off on a tangent or um, start delving deeper into a boring topic. Um, No, I actually want to get better at these podcasts and do a better job in breaking down the things that I want to talk about. Um, And so with that, I'm going to start with that right now. Um, I want to talk about racing and the training and how it is fun versus taking it too seriously. Um, So this is a topic that comes up for a lot of people. I get a lot of questions about, but I've also noticed that a lot of people when they're racing or training or when I see them at swim practices and cycling classes or out on runs, or I can even tell in their racing form and or pre-race how nervous they are and so on. Are they having fun with this, this sport or are they super uptight and almost too focused on it? Because there is a way that we are too focused on it. Um, this sport is a hobby. It's fun. We do it out of enjoyment. It is our free time. It is something like you've heard me say many times before. We went pro in something other than triathlon, ultra endurance running, ultra endurance swimming, super long mountain bikes, etc. All the events that you all are doing out there under the umbrella of ultra endurance events, we choose to do this. We choose to participate in this sport. Excuse me, I shouldn't say participate. We choose to train for this sport. And so if it's causing us stress, if it's causing us anxiety, if it's a headache to get it all in, and of course there are days where it's hard to do it or it's stressful or the schedule just gets in the way and you know, you're know you running from place to place or getting to the pool in the last second and you don't have a lot of time or you know you barely got that run in, you have to quickly shower and get back to the office. I mean, of course, there are days like that and that makes total sense. And quite honestly, that's what makes the sacrifice and the work and the time you put it also worth it because you do fit it in. You do make it work. And, you know, it takes a lot to do this ultra endurance sport, which takes a lot of hours, hence why it's ultra endurance, to get that in as a working person, as a family person, as a person who's not a hermit, who's socially engaged, who has activities and other things going on, and not just sitting around all day getting massages, resting for the next workout. That's called being a pro. And, you know, that's not, I'm not trying to make light of it, sitting around all day. I mean, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of prep and a lot of focus and a lot of logistics to be a pro as well. And maybe on a future podcast, I'll go into that because many people are interested what that looks like and how different it is. But trust me, that gets to be a chore too. Um, so you make those sacrifices and that's what makes the finish line feel so good. That makes what doing this sport, what makes it feel so good, the fact that you are able to get it in, fit it in and move on with your day. I have an athlete who loves the sensation of dropping her kids off at school, going to train most of the day, um, you know, not every day, other days she obviously has a job or responsibilities and family commitments, but there's days once a week maybe in the summer when she's really getting ready for her main event. She drops the kids off at school, trains all day, books it back and is there in the line waiting to pick up her kids just in time um, to, you know, go on with the day, activities, sports and so on for the kids. But in between, she eked out a great four, five, six hour training day. And she loves it. And why? Because she can. She got it done. She made it fit barely. Um, And then she got back. She was there in time with her her kids. She has all kinds of energy and she feels great about it. And that's fun. That's part of the many things that make this fun. So there are so many examples we can go into on why this training, why this racing is fun. Um, 
the sacrifices we've made, the feeling alive, in some cases even setting an example for our kids and our family members of, you know, we get it done and staying healthy and staying fit and paying attention to how you're taking care of this incredible, incredible engine called the body. So and then, of course, the fun part of having fitness for anything and, you know, being able to take on any endeavor and being able to jump into different events and adventures that come up, whether with friends or things that you're curious about. I would say there's not a week that doesn't go by where I either hear from athletes or from my friends of some of the things that they're doing. And, you know, I go to the website and I'm quite curious because that adventure looks great. A trail run running runs once around Mount Hood. Um, somebody just showed me 100K up there. Um, somebody else was telling me about a great Spartan race and an obstacle race that they're doing. Um, that sounded great. All those things we can get ready for, all those things we have a baseline fitness for, all those things are part of the enjoyment on why we do this sport. And so when we get a little bit too far removed from that and the training turns into negative feelings, turns into anxiety, turns into too much pressure, on having to get this done or having to get it in. Um, that's the tipping point that I would want to stay away from for all of you. And some of you have given me feedback over the years like that you don't want to disappoint me or you feel that because the workout's in there, you need to get it done or any type of pressure like that. That is not the type of coaching I ever want to provide. I want to provide the type of coaching that you feel accomplished, that you feel good, that you feel like you're progressing, that you feel like you're getting fitter, healthier, you're more connected to your body. And therefore, because you are all those things, you have more energy at your work, for your family. You are just a better person, and that's a wide description, but a better person because you worked out that day because you're progressing in your hobby and in your sport. Um, the beauty of sports in general for all of us is that it is a progressive um, endeavor. You know, of course, you can get better at many other hobbies and continue to progress in that too. But in sports, it can I t ties into the health, the fitness, and your ability to continue to achieve higher and harder and faster and more difficult goals. So, yeah, the fun in all this. So another other thing I've received feedback about with a lot of my topics that I talk about is what are examples of the opposite or what are examples in general of anything I'm talking about? So examples of it being too much, being too uptight, taking it too serious. Well, the, you know, it's different for everybody. But for example, um, taking this too seriously and it being your only focus usually comes with repercussions, whether that's socially, whether that's at work. Um, we've all gotten to that tipping point or many of us are familiar with that tipping point at work where people think you're taking the sport and your fitness and your healthy lifestyle too serious um, and that they think your priorities are wrong. Um, personally, it's something um, I can't stand because they don't know what's important to you and how focused you are and what your priorities are. It's only a perception. But again, um, in some cases, we might be too focused and spending too much of our day um, locked in on that qualifying for Kona. Um, and, you know, it doesn't happen when you're that locked in on it. And the results don't come when you're that single-minded towards something. And I know that contradicts many of the things that I talk about, whether in my coaching or the podcast here or in my writing with how we prep for events. But being prepared and being focused means something different to me. And this is, again, my opinion and my approach. Being prepared and being focused means that you are thinking ahead 
at certain times during the day towards your next workout in order to achieve the deliberate outcome we're looking for of that workout so that you're not fumbling around during your workout time in order to get the gear or set yourself up for a successful workout. Maybe you do that the night before. Maybe you prep your bag. Maybe you prep your food. Maybe you prep your hydration. Maybe you prep your trainer in order to have a successful workout when the time comes. Um, there's many times I get workout updates or log updates on people who have forgotten certain things or they just didn't think about it or, well, you know, I got up at 4 a.m. after going to bed at 11 p.m. because I just felt I had to get the workout in. Well, no, that's not being focused and deliberate with your training. That's going through the motions on four and a half hours of sleep. Um, so there's many examples of how you are not doing it correctly or you're too focused on it. Too focused also means that there, there's too many sacrifices from a family perspective, from a social engagement perspective, that you're going to bed at 9 o'clock on a Friday where, you know what, it might be time to just chill out a bit. You can go a little bit later. Yes, I would prefer eight hours of sleep, but, you know, if in order to have a nice weekend with your family and friends and loved ones and co-workers or whatever it is, and you're going to bed a little bit later, it's okay. <laughs> we can catch up on sleep. We can go a little bit easier in the next workout because you're keeping it all in balance. I'd rather you be an, a balanced athlete that is able to enjoy the training versus become too focused on the training. And too focused is a negative because it becomes too much of a burden, too much pressure, too little outlets in order to push you towards your results. Um, the ideal description of that, again, of what we're trying to do is progression. And being a little bit better tomorrow than today doesn't mean you have to be super, super uptight and focused on it. Just needs It actually takes the pressure off of saying, all right, what are some little things that I can do to be better tomorrow than today? And many of you have heard from me examples of what those things are, and those aren't necessarily always in the workout. Um, they are many, many little details to set you up for the next best workout. So, Yes, keep in mind, I guess the main point on this whole last section here that I've been talking about is please understand why you're doing this because you want to know that it's fun for you, that you enjoy it, that there's a connection for you, that it truly is something that you prefer to do. It's your free time and our time is always limited and we want it to be something that creates fulfillment and enjoyment and happiness and healthiness and all the positives that come with it. We don't want it to be a chore. We don't want it to cause stress and we don't want it to cause anxiety. Sorry um, that I might have just sort of rambled a little bit there, but it's important to me that the message of this sport, this endeavor of ultra endurance is one that as many as pe people as possible can understand that it's for fun. And of course, our goals are serious. And of course, it's important to all of us. Don't ever let anybody tell you why it's not important um, or take your goals or your thoughts towards your goals or your dreams in this case away from you. Because if it's important to you, if you set yourself up with a solid goal and you really want to achieve it, it's important to you. And you will stay focused on it in a healthy, balanced way. And it's because of your enjoyment. So anybody saying or giving you grief or talking about how, what are you doing? This is too consuming. Or why would you do that to yourself? You can fall back onto the beauty of what we just talked about. It's because you enjoy it. It provides you with joy. It, it is something that is fun for you. And you that's, that's how you tick. And if others don't get that, that's fine. But 
if you can always fall back upon, yes, I dig it. I love it. It just, I feel great doing it. I love the training. I love how I feel. I love the things that it allows me to do. Um, and there's not a week that goes by that I don't have a sense of pride and fulfillment that I did this or that I trained the way I did, then nobody can take that away from you. That is fantastic. And that's why we're doing this sport. So stay true to that. Stay true to the progression of the sport. Stay true to why you enjoy it. And stay true to why it's important to you. And that this lifestyle is something that you enjoy, believe in, and provides more positives than negatives. Okay, so solid 45 minutes in so far, and um, I want to close it out with what I was talking about last week a little bit with regards to the camps that are coming up. So for those of you that are new to this as well as don't know my coaching group and the extended family from it, I have my usual coast ride down the coast of California starting in San Francisco. And this year being an odd year in 2017, we only go to Santa Monica. So four days, about 100 to 125 miles of cycling a day. Um, And we end up in Santa Monica, California, at which point people fly home or drive back home or we provide all kinds of support to get you back home as well. Um, It's fully supported. There's SAG vehicles. It's uh, what I would call catered um, because we have designated SAG spots where you can get your food and water and some snacks and your own food if you have specific requirements. Um, We have meals set up in the evenings and um, upon arrival. So, yeah, the Coast Ride is a blast this year. Um, It's more supported on even, on odd years, excuse me. And then next year, an even year, we ride to San Diego. So five days down the California coast. But it's beautiful, Big Sur, the California coastline, Highway 1, and it's a blast. So January uh, 13th through the 16th, I think it is, this year. It's always on um, MLK, Martin Luther King holiday weekend. So for one day off of work, you get four days of cycling in. So feel free to email me if you have Uh, last minute um, interest on joining. We're about 33 riders right now and the list is just fluctuates around there. The other camp I have coming up in March will be a swim camp fully focused on swimming for four and a half days. There'll be a fifth day in there but that's for people flying in and availability to fly in earlier um, just because that's how flights work from the east coast. You get here earlier in the day So we will use that afternoon, of course, to swim too. But two to three swims a day, yes, that much. Open water, pool swimming, video, wetsuit swimming, stretch cords, um, swim stroke analysis, underwater um, video. Uh, Lots of training, lots of input. And um, really the focus is twofold. One, to slingshot your swim training to a new level. Anytime, anytime anybody gets a chance to swim three, four, five days in a row um, with you know multiple thousands of yards a day, you uh, you come out of it with a new level, a new platform of fitness, and um, it's worked for like a charm for years. And many of my athletes can attest to that, and they're always su- surprised how how significant the leap forward is from doing a, a lot of swimming over five, six days. Um, it's for all levels. So I have all kinds of swimmers in here, ones that are uh, what I call those with the most potential. Um, they are the ones that can improve the most and they therefore have the most potential. They, um, they get a lot of instruction and video analysis and input. And there's other coaches with me doing this. And then there's those with the least potential. They're already fast swimmers, so they're not going to improve that much. But they still have the opportunity to focus on swimming for a couple days, get pushed with some peers, um, get some coaching, get some input, get some open water tips, get some wetsuit tips. We're sponsored by Roca, so we'll have all kinds of wetsuits to demo and use in the open water. Um, Just overall, a full four and a half to five days of swim focus. Of course, you have opportunities to run in between 
and um, bike if you are coming in with your bike. But most choose to just run, do some trail running in between because it is a lot of swimming and it is pretty fatiguing. But yeah, you're going to learn a lot, you're going to swim a lot, and you're going to come away with a lot of value with regards to getting that first discipline out of the way for triathletes. And those of you doing the big open water swims, word on the street has it. I have an athlete who's going to swim Gibraltar, the Strait of Gibraltar this year, from Spain to um, Morocco. Um, He's actually looking for other people on his boat. So if you know anybody who wants to swim with him from Spain to Africa, from Europe to Africa, across the Strait of Gibraltar, we have a boat a captain and a swimmer going. So there's a, there's an opportunity to do something. Talk about adventure, life, checklist. Talk about fitness and fun and doing something different with it. Yep, that's him. He's that type. So, And then finally, the last camp is uh, our all-in camp in Napa. And I call it all-in because uh, we're doing all all kinds of stuff. There's many coaches, there's nutritionists, there's bike fitters, there's lactate testing, there's, you know, we're going to have it all that week. Um, It's seven days. It's a big one. It's fully catered, fully supported. We have massage therapists. We have, we have everything there basically. And a lot of it will revolve around a morning of training, swim, bike, or run. Um, For the ultra runners, there's plenty of trails and open sections and we can do all kinds of work as well but um yeah we'll be swimming biking running mountain biking trail running doing everything and in the afternoons every day we're going to have some education um, anywhere from nutrition work to strength work and trx stretch cords core pilates body weight strength um and we're not going to be necessarily doing it but more demos and plans that you can then take home We'll go over swimming and, again, open water tips and wetsuit stuff and demos. Um, We'll swim in Lake Sonoma where the opportunity is to get on the course for Ironman Santa Rosa as well as Santa Rosa 70.3. Same roads, same run, same swim course. So a great way to demo that course, to get familiar with it. We're going to have all kinds of afternoon seminars that go into You know, whether it's bike fit and um, wind tunnel testing results and making sure you're set up on your bike properly and what to look for. We're going to do lactate threshold testing for all our campers so that they get that value. We're going to have a good explanation of what it means and why we test like that. So every day in the afternoon, there will be some value. There will be some education. There will be something for you to leave that week with knowing that you're better prepared for your season that you're smarter and you have a better outlook on how you want to go about racing. And so this continuing education camp, as I, for lack of a better description, describe it, um, hopefully will provide a ton of value for all of you that are um, taking part in it and that you really walk away from it. It'll be in late April. So going into May, um, you are really prepared for the season. From a gear standpoint, we're going to do gear reviews and talk to um, some experts with that who will be there for that, who've tested everything and can provide the proper input. To, you know, bike fit, as I said, to what else do we need? Swimming, you'll be ready with wetsuits demo demos and open water swim tips and warm up and strength for swimming as well as sighting and getting ready fitness-wise and what to do for your season ahead because we'll have done that there and provided input and then lastly running we'll do some gait analysis we'll do some input there we'll do some um, hill work and strength work to to just leave you with better knowledge of how to structure your season and the training and race prep nutrition work uh, strength work like i always already mentioned and then the big thing is race simulation we'll definitely get out there one day wake up in the morning, eat our race breakfast, go to the swim start, do a swim on the Lake Sonoma on the 70.3 and Ironman swim course, come off of that short transition to a bike ride on the course, Uh, monitor how you are fueling and hydrating and doing that whole transition piece so that, again, you walk away knowing every aspect of your training, racing, gear, prep, 
and we'll do some mindset work too. So, so that'll be a fun week. And guess what? If you don't want to take part in one of those afternoons, it'll be awesome. You can go wine tasting. You can take a cooking class. You can do. You can lounge and chill out in beautiful Napa and Sonoma County. There's so much to do. So. Um, there's also that opportunity. So it'll be a fun week of just doing a thousand things with a thousand different people, although the camp is limited to 20 people. <laughs> so um, it might not be that many people with regards to hanging out to, but a lot of experts on site um, from U.S. Olympic coaches to, of course, uh, plenty of experts in each one of the disciplines to massage therapists and nutritionists. So all right, so that's it. Uh, I think uh, we've covered plenty this week. Again, I am sorry I always talk so long, but as many of you know, I can talk about this stuff all day long, all the time, and once I get going, I love rattling it all off. Hopefully you all got uh, some value out of it again. And um, yeah, next week I have a, a pretty specific topic I want to talk about. It's called Dealing with Failure. I got an email from one of my athletes asking that I should talk about that and how it might uh, be a good topic on this podcast. So I will designate most of the time next week towards dealing with failure. We'll have some quick hits in there on things that come up during the week, but we'll go back to a single big topic for next week. So have a great week. Hopefully next week you'll be better than this week as an athlete, as a person prepared for your ultra endurance adventure and events. And as always, please send me any inquiries or thoughts or input on this podcast. And thank you. Thank you very much for listening and um, yeah, taking part in this AIMP Weekly Word podcast. Have a great week. Bye.